we come together this evening on this last weekend before our national election. And we do so as a people of faith, a people of prayer, and a people of hope. One of the most fundamental teachings of our faith is the sovereignty of our almighty God. All things are under his direction and his control. That yes, he gives us free will, but he governs all things. As the catechism teaches us, nothing happens unless he permits it to occur. And he permits it because he respects the freedom of all of us and he knows how to bring good from it. There is so much talk about the angst of so many as we approach Tuesday. I heard the other day that there has been a new psychological diagnosis that's been created called election stress disorder. <laughs> how foolish we can be. Certainly this is the most important election between two very different visions of America that are held by the competing candidates and their parties and it has prompted an especially contentious debate and a level of social unrest. And yet I am convinced that this is not a singular or unique situation. It has always been so. Politics simply reflects the human person in society, and the human person wounded by original sin will always be in conflict within himself and with others. It is Satan's great work to cause conflict, to create hostility and division. And of course, all of this can only be overcome in Christ. Indeed, he is the only remedy that can restore unity and peace. Man and woman were created in this state we call original holiness. They were originally in this state of harmony with God and with one another, but that first original sin disrupted all of that. And so the Son of God became man. He united all of humanity to himself and to his divinity to recreate all of us in him to save us from our sins so that we might once again know that harmony and peace. And it is why societies must be infused with the love, with the law of God so that they may be more just and peaceful. And tragically, this is one of the battles being waged in the current election. We have a government that repudiates the law of God, most tragically in its claim that the destruction of the unborn child in the womb of his or her mother, this incomprehensible evil that is abortion, is somehow a law. We see the assault on holy matrimony, the government claiming that it can now be celebrated among any persons, seeking to change the unchanging law of God that the reality of marriage completes the human person. Man and woman in that fullness of the complementarity of humanity, a love that bears fruit and sublime blessing of children. But most recently, the attack has come directly against the church with various laws and executive orders regarding health care that demand that the church act contrary to our beliefs, resulting in groups like the Little Sisters of the Poor having to seek regress from the courts to oppose this illegitimate intrusion into our constitutionally guaranteed right of freedom of religion. St. Paul's words of our second reading are especially apt here, that we must pray intently so that we may be delivered from perverse and wicked people, for not all have faith. But again, this isn't anything new. Our first reading deals with the same reality, a government attacking religion. 
The second book of Maccabees occurs about 175 years at the time before the birth of Christ. The once powerful Greek empire, soon to be overthrown, is seeking the destruction of God's chosen people. And so seven sons and their mothers are arrested and tortured, seeking to force them to follow the Greek pagan customs, but they refuse, and they do so with the strength and confidence of all the martyrs throughout history, a strength which God alone can give. Four years ago, in our last election cycle, the late Archbishop of Chicago and former president of our National Conference of Bishops, Francis Cardinal George, spoke particularly about the federal government's assault on religious freedom. He commented to a group of his priests as described later in an article that he would write in his archdiocesan newspaper, not in a sense of a specific prediction, but in a dramatic comment upon the hostile attacks by government on our religious freedom. It's now a famous quote. He said, I will die in my sleep. My successor will die in prison. His successor will die a martyr in the public square. These are compelling words, and they should rally all of us to fight valiantly against this assault, to vote to stop it, and to peacefully work always to build a just and a free society. But they're not words to engender fear or dread. Again, those seven brothers and their mother, each to be tortured and killed, speak of the truth that sustained them and is meant to sustain us always. We too are ready to die rather than to transgress the law of God because we know the king of the world will raise us up to live again forever. While we strive to be faithful citizens of this country, our lasting citizenship is not here, but it is in heaven. And that's what our gospel's pointing to. There's this dialogue between the Sadducees who claim to be religious leaders but deny the basic truth of the resurrection and Jesus, and they pose that question about the brother, the brother successfully marrying the one woman as a trick to try to entrap him and to use that against him. And of course, Jesus knows this, and he does not respond in angry argumentation, but as he always does, in love, to pose to them a deeper understanding of who he is and how we are to live here and now. He's talking about that the sacrament of marriage is not an end in and of itself, but is an experience of God's love that is meant to point us to that infinite love of God that will be ours, we pray, for all of eternity. For all of our loves flow from God's love for us, but all of them must be ordered to the love of God and never seek to supplant it. And so we gather here to pray, and we gather here to receive our Lord in the Holy Eucharist, to be strengthened to work to change our culture so that it may more fully embrace the truths of our faith, which is the only way our culture or any culture can hope to survive. But we do it with great hope and with joy. Cardinal George, in that same article in which he recounted those compelling words that he would die in his sleep, his successor would die in prison, and that his successor would then die a martyr, he was quick to note that there was a fourth sentence that was never picked up by the websites that covered that quote. That fourth sentence was, his successor will then pick up the shards of a ruined society and slowly help rebuild civilization as the church has so often done in human history. If it be God's will, may the results of this election be such so that the further ruination of our society might be avoided. But if not, and in whatever circumstances we face, 
Let us engage our society and our world always with the courage and the strength of the martyrs, trusting that all is under God's care and somehow all part of his plan. Let us live with confidence and hope that do not come about from any political movement or political outcomes, but from, from Jesus' promise to St. Peter at Caesarea Philippi that the gates of hell shall never prevail against his church. Then amidst all that political unrest and societal conflict that always will be, we will live filled with peace and consolation, remembering those last words of Jesus recorded by St. Matthew in his gospel, that I am with you always, even until the end of time.